So welcome to this uh, wonderful and interesting and very controversial interview that we're going to have with Ben Bayer. He is a fellow member of the NREN Institute and for the NREN Center Latin America. Today, we're going to discuss some of the brilliant ideas that he is sharing with us in his new book, Why the Right to Abortion is Sacrosanct. So thank you very much, Ben, <laughs> uh, first for writing that book and second for for um, giving us this interview. You've been writing on the topic of abortion for a long time and you've currently published this book. Do you perhaps see the right to abortion is in danger in the United States? Oh, definitely. Uh, so this is a topic I've been writing on for maybe four years or so uh, at ARI. The book itself is really just a, it's a collection of some of the essays that I've written for our publication, New Ideal. Not everything I've written on abortion, but like the key essays that give the most essential points one needs to understand the objectivist position on this. And the reason that we decided to put it together into a little booklet is because yes, absolutely, abortion rights are in danger in the United States. We've seen it coming for a while now Uh, today is June 23rd, two, uh, 2022. It seems almost a certainty that we're going to get a decision from the Supreme Court within the next week, perhaps even as soon as tomorrow. And if what we get is anything like the decision that was leaked uh, from the court back in early May, then it it's either going to overturn Roe v. Wade or it's at least going to dramatically restrict its reach Uh, I think uh, it's it's probably going to be overturned. I I hope I'm wrong, uh, but um, so it's it's that means it's it, that abortion rights are in danger for women all over America. Uh, half of the states uh, will have laws, if not severely restricting abortion, then banning it outright if if uh, Roe v. Wade is overturned. So in your book, you make the case that uh, this unfortunate situation is also happening because none of the defenders of the right to abortion make a good solid defense of the right to abortion. And they end up doing more harm than good, giving support to this right, especially the liberals, right? Like the Democrats. And, and you say that their arguments are so weak that they end up being mocked and taken advantage by the opposing position. What are the errors that you see in these arguments? Altogether, what most defenders of abortion rights lack is any kind of moral seriousness on this subject. Uh, now, to some extent, that's understandable. Uh, they, uh, the, the only, uh, case they've heard on the other side is is from the perspective of religious morality they might just not take religion seriously and they might kind of run morality and religion together but they're not the same thing there are there is a secular uh there are secular moral theories there are secular moral outlooks and uh, people generally have the idea that uh you don't that th there's something wrong with murder so Uh, whether for religious or secular reasons, if if you if you say something like, "My body, my choice," okay, that's fine. But we don't usually think that my body, my choice includes using your body to violate someone else's rights. Or if you say abortion is health care, well, well, since when does your uh, health justify murder? If you don't address the fundamental assumption of the anti-abortion argument, which is that the fetus or the embryo is a human being with rights, which when you kill it, you're committing murder. If you don't address that, you end up sounding like you're saying uh, you can you can achieve various goals using murder as a means. And that I think has the, that makes it sound like you think life is cheap and you don't care about morality. And I think that's part of the reason why the, uh, the abortion uh, rights defenders have have uh, have been losing the argument. And I'll add one more point to that, which is that almost everybody in uh, the world, uh, regardless of what side of the political aisle they're on, when they think in terms of morality to the extent that they're morally serious, 
they equate morality with selflessness, with self-sacrifice, with altruism. And if that's if that's what you equate with morality, then in fact you're you're gonna have a hard time explaining why it's moral to get an abortion and therefore why it, why there's a moral right to an abortion. The the moral assumptions uh, that most people accept would have you believe that uh, you should if if you're suddenly if a burden is forced upon you if, if if there's some other being that has a demand on you you should be selfless and sacrifice and give up your comfort and happiness and uh, and prosperity to sacrifice for it and who are you to be selfish and say no it's my life uh, I want to do what I want to do that doesn't look like a moral decision and so one of the things that I think uh, basically dooms the leftist defense of abortion rights is that they have embraced the morality of selflessness, self-sacrifice on every other topic, and you hear them invoking it on every other topic. Uh, you know, the rich people uh, are selfish. That's when when they uh, are successful in business, they're just exploiting the little guy and they should really give it up. And and who are they to demand their own wealth and happiness? They should they should sacrifice for the little guy. Well, there's no little guy littler than the fetus. And so if uh, if you accept that moral premise that you should sacrifice for the little guy, it's going to be very hard to justify abortion. And, and I think that's part of the reason why the the left, to the extent that they try to defend abortion, they, they kind of don't even really want to talk about morality because they know that the moral premises that they accept probably really don't defend abortion rights, don't support abortion rights in the first place. So for what I understand, what we use a philosophical moral defense of the right of abortion, one of the things that I have noticed in my discussions of the subject is that the concept of individual rights is key to this issue. And many of those who consider abortion a crime do so because they have a very different concept of individual rights from the one held by Rand or objectivism. Can we navigate this topic, please? And if this is a point that you consider important in the moral argument for abortion that we need to offer, because if individual rights are associated with individual, what is the individual? Because a lot of people assign rights to a fetus or an embryo without understanding what the individual is. So one interesting point here is I don't actually hear people talking about individual rights that much at all on either side of this controversy when they talk about who has, whether there's a right to an abortion. They talk about rights, uh, the rights of the woman or the rights of the fetus, but they usually need to be reminded that uh, when we talk about rights in the West, that the, the key idea that uh, you evaluate a society according to whether or not it violates or protects individual rights that that's something that is only maybe an afterthought and then once you introduce that into the conversation if if you remind them no we're really talking about individual individual rights you need to remind them what that actually even means what is individual what does it mean to say there are individual rights well for example it means that if if you have a majority of people who let's say believes and practices uh, one set of ideas, an individual who's in the minority or maybe who's the only one in the whole society, if you think he has an individual right, it means that they've got the, he's got the right to disagree, right to speak his mind, right to go his separate way, disassociate from all these other people. And they can't by the sheer force of their majority uh, vote to enslave him or, or stop him from speaking his mind or make him associate with other people. So the, the idea of individual rights is the idea that if if we think there's something important about an, if, if we think there is something important about an individual pursuing their own life, pursuing their own happiness, even when it comes into, uh, when, even when it counts as disagreeing with other people's conceptions of happiness, they need to be able to do that. They need to be able to go their separate ways. They need to be able to disagree and to live free from the coercion of other people who might happen to disagree. What matters here for why we have individual rights is that we all have separate minds living in separate bodies 
uh, and we can make separate choices that we're, we're not part of a kind of collective organism where we're all uh, kind of fused together or that we, we, we don't all live by kind of remote control of some hive mind. And so when you think about individual rights in that way, and I think that's just a kind of ordinary conception of uh, the way we think about individual rights in connection with freedom of speech and freedom of religion, freedom of association, uh, freedom of the press, that has some real implications for how we think about abortion. Because if, if you, uh, to, to have the kind of individual rights I've just been talking about, you've actually got to be an individual. And what does it mean to be an individual? Well, in a very generic sense, all it means to be individual is to mean is to be separate or distinct in some way. But there's lots of different ways and different respects in which we can be separate or distinct. So, for instance, a fetus has it's true that a fetus has separate, distinct DNA. It has different organs uh, from its mother. And so what you might say, and some people do say, well, that makes it an individual and that's what gives it individual rights. But the distinct and separate DNA, uh, that's not what's important for individual rights generally. I mean, if, you're, if you've got two identical twins who have the same DNA, we don't say, well, therefore they don't have any rights against each other. <laughs> No, they still have individual rights and they have the right if they have the right to disagree with each other and 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 go live completely separate lives even though they've got the same DNA. So what what gives like twins individual rights is nothing to do with their DNA. It's the fact that they they too have separate minds living in separate bodies who make and who can and should make separate decisions. That's what having individual rights is all about and Notably, if you follow the way that I've set this up, um, that's something fetuses don't have. They, they don't have separate minds living in separate bodies. They are housed in the body of a woman who has a mind and a life of her own. They're physically connected to it. And it's, it's that the fact that they've got separate DNA just has nothing to do with rights. And they don't have the thing that has everything to do with rights, which is physical and physiological individuation. He, hearing all this, uh, I think that we definitely need a good defense for abortion rights uh, with a good morality. But before we go to that, I would like us to check the premises of the arguments presented by those who are against abortion and consider it a crime, right? Like, like you were talking about the different DNA, but how that argument rapidly gets canceled when you talk about uh, twins, for example. But you mentioned these arguments in your book. For example, the embryo or the fetus is life. It has heartbeats at some point. It has sensations and it is a human being. Then it has the right to live as you or me or whatever other individual. The fetus has its own DNA, but we already discussed that one, different from his parents. Therefore, there is a person or the fetus is an actually living, not a potential. Yeah, so one thing that I think is common to all these arguments is that is they all start with premises that are that are true in 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 some sense, uh, but the conclusion doesn't usually follow from the premise because it's not the, the conclusion doesn't use all the same concepts in the same sense as the true premise. So it's true, for instance, that the fetus or the embryo is alive. I mean, it's not, it's not dead. There's some metabolic activity going on there. But there are a lot of things that are alive uh, that we don't think have rights. Uh, there's moss. There's amoebas. Uh, it, almost everybody thinks those are alive and don't have rights. A lot of people uh, think that cows don't have rights, uh, but uh, those are definitely alive. Now, maybe if you believe in animal rights, you think they do. But I think most of the people who oppose abortion uh, don't believe in animal rights and they don't have any trouble seeing that a cow can be alive uh, but not have any rights. It's, of course, true that the the human embryo, in addition to being alive, is also a human embryo. You know, it's not a dog embryo. It's not a cow embryo. It's not a amoeba. But it's still not an individual human being. It, it, there's There's... There's such a thing as human life that's not yet an individual human being. It's the beginning of the human life process or life cycle, but it is not yet born 
to be an individual human being. Uh, this is this is often the point that this is often put as it's a potential individual human being, but it's not an actual human being. And you know, you could give other examples to drive this point home. Uh, a brain dead human being who's uh, living on a heart lung machine, who's got all the DNA of a human being, and even one whose heart is beating because it's being you know pumped by a machine, we wouldn't say that such a being has rights either because uh, just like the fetus hasn't yet been born, in this case, the 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 brain dead human being has has died in the relevant sense that makes for human life, which is uh, the it, its capacity to live as an independent being, which you know you need a brain to do, has gone out of existence. Uh, yeah, so you already uh, you the second one you mentioned was the DNA one. I think we talked about that one already, um, and then the third you mentioned was the fetus is an is not just a potential; it's an actual. Uh, living being. Some people will say, well, it's true that it is an actual living fetus. Everything that exists is an actual something. Uh, but an actual living fetus is a potential, is only a potential individual human being. Just like an actual individual human being is only a potential human corpse. So there's lots of things that can be an actual one thing, but still be a potential other thing. So a lot of people, because of accepting this living condition, think that abortion is murder, but still defend abortion. It's, it's not that they think that it's not murder. They say, yes, it is murder because it is a living thing. But still, in this case, there is a right to murder. Can you explain why abortion is not murder if it's uh, ending a living, uh, existing thing that might not be an individual, but is a human life? Well, it's true that abortion is killing, but murder is usually defined as unjustifiable homicide, uh, as, as killing a human being with rights in a way that's not justifiable. So just to give another example, something like uh, killing in self-defense is a killing it's killing a human being it's even in that case it's even killing an individual human being but we still think it's justifiable killing because someone else is trying to kill you and you have the right to defend your life against that other person and so that's another case where it's killing but not murder and i think there's more cases than that i i wouldn't say as i think some do that what justifies abortion is that it's a form of self-defense uh that implies that the fetus is some kind of agent that's threatening you, but because I don't think it's even an individual to begin with, I don't think it can actually threaten you. It's just, it's a burden and uh, hasn't become individuated yet. And so therefore doesn't have individual rights in the first place. And so the reason killing it doesn't count as murder is because it's not, uh, it's is because it's justifiable to kill something that doesn't have rights. And there's another thing in your book, you talk about the secular sanctity of life, making a difference from the religious point of view on sanctity. And you mentioned this concept as part of your argument for the right to abortion. Can you explain this life as a supreme value, but for who someone has to be the valuer? There's no value without anyone to value it. Well, you've, uh, you've explained a, a good amount of it there already. But I'll just mention the, the reason that this, the reason that I make this point and the reason that we gave the title to the book that I did is purposefully to be provocative and to invert the usual kind of language that's used on the other side of this issue. It's, it's usually the anti-abortion rights people who say that they are pro-life, who say that they are concerned with the sanctity of life. The trouble with that is, and the reason I think we should never call them pro-life, we should call them anti-abortion, is that the kind of life that they're interested in, in protecting, the life of the embryo or of the fetus, uh, well, while it may be uh, valuable or uh, precious to a mother who wants to have a child, if she doesn't want it, it's not, its life is not necessarily valuable to anyone. Uh, if you don't believe in a God and I don't believe in a God, then it's not valuable to a God. 
Uh, it's certainly not valuable to the fetus itself. The fetus itself, uh, because it's not an individual, it can't get act. It doesn't value anything in the way that human beings do. And what's distinctive about human life and what, what makes it precious and what makes things preciously valuable to human beings is the fact that uh, some of us are desperately trying to live it. Some of us have one and only one life that we've been given and we we want to make the most of it. And so it's it's really, it's our choice that makes it precious. It's our choice that makes it sacred. That our, the things we want to achieve in life are sacred to us because we need them to live the one and only life we have. And that's exactly the situation that the, the woman is in when she chooses to have a child because she wants to have a child. Then the child's precious to her, but so and and so is her life. She sees the child as part of her life. She wants to add it to her life. But when she doesn't want a child, when it isn't part of her plan, uh, when other things in her life are what she's she wants to prioritize, those things are sacred to her life. Her life is sacred to her and bringing a child into her life that she doesn't want. Uh, that is something that that is a violation of that sanctity, especially so, when it's imposed on on her by the force of law. Right, because then you are absolutely violating the individual rights of the person who's already been born and who is making choices, which is the woman. But what would you say if they say, OK, maybe the child has no value to the potential mother. Maybe the child doesn't have a value or, or the fetus has a value. In, in its life itself, because it has no capacity of having consciousness uh, to value its own life. And maybe there's no value in a God that does not exist for that um, fetus to exist. But what about the collective value, which is some of the argument of the anti-abortionist people is like, even if the mother doesn't want it, she should get pregnant, have the child, and then give it to adoption because potentially someone else is going to find value in that child's life. Yes, well, that was that's why it's so important that we get clear on uh, what kind of value premises, what kind of basic moral ideas we're starting with when we think about this controversy. Because, yeah, if you go by the conventional ideas about what morality requires, uh, you'll think, exactly what you just said. You'll think that uh, there's somebody out there who wants babies. Uh, it's the obligation of these women to give up nine months of their life to be baby factories and uh, pr produce it for the sake of those others who want to be able to adopt. But I think there's no real rational basis for that view of morality in spite of the fact that so many people believe it. I'm, you know, I work for the Ayn Rand Institute and uh, we uh, at the Institute are in agreement with Ayn Rand's idea that your own life is your own highest value, that no one has the right to demand you uh, to sacrifice any of your time to them. There are, we have to choose the people that we wanna have relationships with. And when we, when we do, we see them as part of our life and we want, to, we want to make them happy, but that's only because we see them as part of our life. And so uh, that being the case, a woman, has the right to live her life uh, because it's right for her to live her life. It's because it's right for her to pursue her happiness. And so no, and, and she needs to be able to use her body the way that she wants to, to do it. That means that she needs to have a choice about how to exercise her reproductive capacities. She's an individual with, with rights. Her life is of value to her. Uh, it's her right to live it consistent with the rights of others and a fetus isn't an individual, it doesn't have rights, and so the woman has the right to an abortion. So for last question, uh, let's hear now what a good defense of abortion rights would sound like, and can you tell me what is the real philosophical debate here, and can you offer some, uh, to close this interview, the moral case for the right to abortion? Because I sense that even people that are for abortion, they don't think it's a moral stand. They just think it, they just think it's it's right 
It's better than the alternative, but not necessarily moral. And I, 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 I sense, especially in Latin America, with people that are trying to defend abortion rights as something that is the less the less mean of all the bad things that could happen, you know, like it's because after a rape is because it, it, it's going to be for an uh, adolescent girl that is, is, is going to have her future completely harmed and, and in absolute poverty, but not necessarily because they see it as a moral good, correct thing to do is just the lesser of all evils. So how could we offer a moral case? For, for abortion. Sure. So some of the things I said in response to your last question already help answer that question, but I'll, I'll drill down on a few key points. So think for the moment, just leave aside the question of abortion. And suppose you've got a woman who is, let's say, uh, uh, grows up in a working class family. She's not given a lot. And she she studies hard, she works hard to work her way up in the world, work her up, work her way up through the, the ladder of the business world, uh, finally earns enough money to, let's say, purchase her own business. Uh, going through the, all those steps, I think most people would say, well, that takes a lot of uh, integrity and it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of virtue and that, that fighting your way up in life like that is a good thing to do, that it's a morally good thing to do. Now, if you accept that in uh, as a characterization of what this woman is living her life to do, the fact that she also sometimes has to make choices to prioritize her life in favor of, let's say, her career as opposed to raising a child is no different. Uh, is as long as you assume and 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 I would argue for the assumption that the fetus doesn't have rights, then it's a supremely moral thing. It's a, it's a courageous thing. It requires integrity, especially in a world that opposes you, right? So especially in a world where that thinks that abortion is immoral, it especially takes courage and integrity to have the courage of your convictions to make that choice. But even if the world didn't agree with you, it would still be a difficult choice. It would require a lot of thinking. Uh, it's it's easy for people to be pressured into having children because it's what their parents want you to do. And you have to think, no, my parents aren't there to plan my life for me. I'm the one who's doing it. I have priorities. This thing in my life comes first. Maybe you want to have children. Maybe you don't. But if you want to, maybe you want to have them in the under the best circumstances possible. There's a lot of people who have children and who even raise children, but they only do it because it happens to them. They haven't planned it out. They don't do it responsibly, and they aren't very good parents when, sometimes when that happens. And so somebody you somebody who wants to have children, but not yet, it, it's supremely responsible for them to, to be able to plan it uh, for the time in their life when they're ready for it and when it will most contribute to their happiness and to the happiness of the child. And some women don't want to have children at all because they want to concentrate on uh, on other relationships that they already have, on the career that they're pursuing right now, and children are just not ever going to be a part of that for them. And just as we celebrate the courage and integrity and uh, confidence of of a woman who who otherwise is pursuing her happiness in her career, we should do the exact same thing for one who decides to have an abortion. Do you think it is useful to make the comparison that there are no laws that infringe in men's bodies? I've heard also that argument when they say like, well, mention me one law that's, that the state is trying to implement to enforce something against uh, a man's decision to its own body. Do you think that that's a, a, an accurate argument? So, yeah, I mean, I think you're probably right that there aren't any laws that infringe on male bodily autonomy in the same way that abortion bans do on women. Uh, I think it's good that there aren't, but that <laughs> it's it would be better if there weren't any such laws for women as well. And men who value their bodily autonomy, there have been many of them speaking up lately about vaccines. 
uh, should if they if they're serious about that and they're not just making a kind of cynical tongue in cheek argument, then they should think about what it means to say uh, they have the right to bodily autonomy. Think about why it's important and realize that all those reasons apply in spades uh, to a woman who's faced with the prospect of being forced to give birth. I mean, somebody who's forced to get the jab has to suffer a, a little pinprick and risk of maybe some small side effects. Uh, somebody who's forced to give birth, and that is what abortion bans are. Someone who's forced to give birth is forced to carry a child for nine months and then either to have a procedure that's the equivalent of physical torture or a forced surgery, either live labor or C-section. And that's a tremendous infringement on bodily autonomy if she doesn't want to have the child. Thank you so much, Ben, for writing this book, for, for giving such a light. I sincerely hope that the United States stays true to its, the principles that it was established uh, with. And we will see in the further weeks how this unravels. But in the meantime, I hope that uh, because of this interview, more people get uh, interested in reading your book and having better explanations to defend uh, this right. Uh, it, it, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, Gloria.